Good morning and welcome to Monday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. I'm joined by the esteemed and ever popular Dr. T.C. Fuller. Good morning, T.C. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. I got the coffee going. Uh, hopefully my bride can get me a doctor's appointment. I think I got some TMJ coming up here. Oh, it is very uncomfortable. Uh, you spend too many years getting slapped in the face by women in bars. And, yeah. uh, that happens. That happens. That's right. Let's talk about some sponsors, TC. You know, we're very fortunate to have some amazing sponsors like Appalachian Standard, maker of the finest CBD product that your money can possibly buy. We got deep discounts for everybody watching the show this morning. So please head on over to apphemp.com. Check out their salves, their tinctures. That's the drops you can put under your tongue like I do. Now they have flour. If you're into smoking the hemp flour, it actually has a lot of health benefits to it. Please do the research. Find out if it's right for you. But fair warning. If you're like TC and I, and you had spent your adult life taking your analysis in front of other men, then uh, you may have to uh, hold off on some of the full spectrum stuff because you will pop on your analysis. So full disclosure on that. But you can also use the salves to help with some of those achy joints and areas like that. But let's also talk about Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. The Bob XL is just striking opponent, body opponent bag XL. And it's, XL means it's extra long. It has plenty of room for you to get in those leg kicks, common peroneal strikes. If you're into PPCT stuff, Bob XL is an amazing tool. Three-dimensional shooting target. You bet he'll do that. Want to stab him? Uh, you could. I have done it. I don't know that I would. Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend that stabbing Bob. Maybe you could stab him. Definitely don't slash Bob because he doesn't come back together. But with, he'll eat all the five, five, six that you want to throw at him. Cool fire trainer, cool fire trainer. Why dry fire, TC, when you can cool fire? You know what I'm saying? Excellent cool fire. Question. <laughs> Excellent question, right? The cool fire trainer is an amazing training tool. It's your gun. It's your, your grip panel. If you've got some sort of exotic grip panel on there, it's your trigger. If you got some cool trigger in there, a Timony or an Apex or one of those other amazing triggers, it's your gun. All you got to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring and you get felt recoil so please check out cool fire trainer we also have mountain man medical you're far more likely as dr fuller would tell you on today's show i'm sure to use your life-saving skills than you are your life taking skills so please get a trauma kit from mountain man medical it is the most affordable trauma kits that i'm aware of and then brian mclaughlin over there former navy corpsman who fought in, alongside the marines taking care of them in afghanistan and American Warrior Society put together a co-branded trauma kit. And for, I think, $130, you can have all your needs met. So please check out everything they have to offer. Last but certainly not least is Precision Holsters. I'm wearing the Precision Holsters belt as we speak. It's an amazing belt. The belt is the foundation, as TC will tell you, of your concealed carry. And the Precision Holsters belt is outstanding. Uh, highly recommend them, as well as the Ultra Appendix Rig and their competition line. Competition line is something new to Precision Holsters, and they are crushing it. Uh, if you want to check out the bigger circle with my dear friend and business partner, Mike Seeklander, him and Rob Latham put together the bigger circle. And guess what? They're both wearing Precision Holsters holsters. So if it works for them, guess what, folks? It's going to work incredibly well for you. So with, and with that, I think we're done with sponsor reads, TC. Excellent. Got 14 folks joining us so far. Let's welcome some people onto the show. Who we got here? We got Will Parker from Montana, coin number 800. If you want to find out what a coin number is, you're going to have to check out the American Warrior Society. And while you're there, you can read some of the articles by Dr. Fuller, who's today's guest. I've put a link in the show notes today to his most recent article, May You Live in Interesting Times. Uh, it's a phenomenal article and really foretells a lot of the things that we're experiencing now. Corey Johnson is on. Will Rhodes is on. My lovely bride, Miss Lisa, says, good morning, TC. Good morning, morning everyone. Lisa. Jesse is on from Michigan, coin number 2221. Uh, Diesel is on. Says, morning, all. Good morning, Diesel. Walt is on. Greg is on. Mark Hamilton. Alan Kelly, good morning. He says, uh, from Liberated Virginia this morning. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's It's amazing how quickly things can turn, right, TC? It's true. It's true. Happily. Yeah, in this happily. case, at least. Yeah, no kidding. Let's let's read your bio and get into today's show. I'm very excited to have you on, brother. Uh, T.C. Fuller is an experienced federal investigator and firearms trainer. 
He has spent his life carrying a firearm for the United States government. TC first served as an Army infantry officer, explosive ordnance disposal officer before leaving the Army to accept an appointment as a special agent for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He spent the next 20 years working in all areas of investigative interest within the FBI and served for several years as an instructor at the FBI's Firearms Training Unit in Quantico, Virginia. TC holds a Bachelor of Science in Criminology as well as a Master of Education in Interdisciplinary Studies and a Doctorate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. As a published author, TC has written an innovative book on the topic of improving law enforcement deadly force training, as well as having written for several print magazines on the areas of law enforcement procedures, explosives, firearms, and edged weapons. Among TC's personal achievements, he has been awarded the United States Army's highest peacetime award for heroism, the Soldier's Medal. Besides finding, capturing, and convicting a fugitive on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, TC has also been a successful competitive shooter for more than 20 years, earning a master's class certification from the International Defensive Pistol Association and winning numerous local, state, and regional competitions along the way. He now is operating his own company, the Horus Group LLC, links in today's show notes, which serves as a consultancy on firearms and training, as well as providing high-end private firearms training for both armed professionals and citizens alike. TC, welcome. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to have you. We got uh, 22 folks on. Please like and hit that share button. Somebody gave a, an angry face. Alan, uh, maybe something TC did. I don't know if I answer for that. <laughs> Skip says, love my precision holsters. Good morning from cool Arab, Alabama. And Wade Osborne says, good morning, Rich. Uh, and TC, coin number 1788. And if you want to know what a coin number is, please check out American Warrior Society and find out if becoming a member of our self-defense community is the right thing for you and your loved ones. Dr. Fuller, man, what is your bio overlook, brother? What is my bio overlook? Well, um, I'm a Taurus. I'm from California. I like long walks on the beach. Um, what does it overlook? Uh, gee, my, I guess my my proudest accomplishment, I'm the father of three, uh, 29, six, and three years old, because I'm that guy. Uh, so I, uh, what else? I paid for my bachelor's by teaching karate. I used to be a, a karate uh, competitor. I traveled all over the United States, went to the AAU Nationals a couple times. Uh, so I've been beaten up and outshot all over the country by some of the best, is what I like to, like to tell people. Uh, and I guess uh, I like to collect experiences for my dotage, right? Because someday all I'm going to have is what's going on in my head as I sit and drool on myself in a home somewhere. So I've I've run the bulls in Pamplona. I've climbed the pyramids in Giza, uh, me and two drunk Australians. Uh, I've been to 49 states. I've walked all the stations of the cross in Jerusalem. And most importantly, I've stood on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. So that was kind of an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> Well, I think so. I'm not sure how many other people do, but it, it was pretty cool to me. What's the one state you're missing? Nebraska. Really? It is. And, uh, uh, you know, I keep threatening my wife that one day when she goes to work, I'm just going to run up, hop on a plane, fly to Nebraska, touch a wall, jump on a plane and fly home and be home for dinner. <clears throat> but uh, I think there's an argument to be made that if you've been to Kansas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, South Dakota, you got to really look hard for something new in Nebraska. So, yeah, uh, but I'll get there. I will get there. Yes, you will. I, I you know what? I didn't know uh, your karate experience. That's pretty oh, impressive. Okay. Ah, well, you know, it was, it was how I paid. Like I said, it's how I paid for my bachelor's. I started uh, when I was about 14, 15 years old. I got into it pretty hard. I competed. Um, I taught. Uh, it was very traditional style of Shotokan and Shodenji style of martial arts. So, you know, I started out I paid for my lessons. I didn't have any money. So I paid for my lessons by cleaning the dojo, you know, uh, the old Daniel son wax on wax off on the floors. That was me. Yeah. So back in the day. Yeah. We were pretty cool back in the day. I'll tell you that. I was very cool back in the day. <laughs> I saw that picture of you, man. I need to put that in today's show notes. Uh, you sitting by the, the bridge in San, San Francisco, man. Yeah, that was, that was a good day. That was a very good day. But you know, now I'm going with a little bit of facial hair. I'm not, I'm no Jeff Brown or, Will Parker, but, uh, you know, at least I want to be mentioned in the same breath. So exactly. Will Par speaking of Will Parker says, ride your motorcycle there and I'll meet you in Nebraska. That's awesome. Now that sounds like fun right there. That does sound like fun. All right, let's get into the show. TC. Um, you have a, I want to start off with the instructor piece because I don't think I've ever talked to you about this before. And I know that 
uh, you have a tremendous amount of instructor time. Matter of fact, I talked to one of your friends who's uh, a federal agent who was on the line with you teaching at uh, Quantico, and he had nothing but good things to say to you, which was kind of a shock to me. But anyway. Was he drunk? He might have been drunk. <laughs> he was not drunk. Uh, what makes a great instructor, in your opinion? A great instructor. You know, that's that's a good question. You've been asking it a lot lately of your, of your guests, and I think that's really a good idea because you get some real good uh, opinions and perspectives on that. Um, I, I was very, very fortunate when I was teaching at Quantico to be in the presence of some really fantastic instructors. I mean, I got there, I was, you know, deep in my career and there were guys on the line that had been my instructors when I went through as a brand new uh, baby agent. And so it was really great, not only to teach there at Quantico and have that experience, but to, to study at the feet of those kind of people that had uh, just phenomenal amounts of instruction time. And, you know, I, as you pointed out earlier, I, I've done a lot of formal research on the topic. Uh, worked on my master's and my doctorate on the subject of, of instruction and delivering instruction, making meaning out of information, how we convey information from one person to another in a way that is memorable and useful. Uh, and kind of boiling it all down, I'd come back to two things that are just impossible for me to get around. You got to have passion for the topic <clears throat> and you got to have knowledge. Yep. You know, that passion is the fuel that drives everything else, right? If you if you don't have that passion, you're just you're you're going to burn out. You're not going to last long. Uh, your guest last week, Dan Brady, when when he first came through the Vermont Police Academy, I was one of his instructors, and he had passion. You know, he he clearly wanted to to shoot guns, but like every young, just out of the military infantryman, especially, uh, you know, he knew it all, right? He really knew it all. Well, the reality was he didn't have the knowledge, and you had to have the knowledge um, because if you're passionate about your topic that you're teaching but you don't know what you're doing. You're not only, you may be instructing well, but you're a hazard. You know, you're yeah. really, you're causing problems if you're putting out information in a way that's memorable and useful, but it's bad information. Um, so I think you have to have those two things. Now, happily in Dan's case, once I got his attention, uh, which, you know, took sort of the metaphorical two by four to the head. Uh, once, once I got his attention, he dove right into the knowledge piece. Once he realized he didn't know anything or didn't know nearly as much as he thought he knew, uh, he did the right thing. He, he went out and he pursued that knowledge and he continues to do so today, 20 years later. And I think that's, that's really critical for someone to be a great instructor. I'm also very suspicious of people that always say, I am a great instructor. They say that of themselves. Um, it's like saying, I am a great parent. You know, th th that's a mantle that needs to be given to you by others. You know, if you're, if you are a great parent, it's not for you to say, right? If you are a great instructor, it's not for you to say. Um, too many instructors, I know you've seen these people out there. We all have, if you've spent any time uh, getting training is <clears throat> they believe that their success is defined by their actions. You know, I, I am a great instructor because I do these things. I teach every weekend, you know, 45 weekends a year or something. They lose sight of the fact that student success is the goal. You know, your great instructor recognizes that their achievements are made by, not by themselves, but by their students. That, that is your sign bearer. That is your, your person that's going to go out there and show, yes, you are a great instructor because this person is good at what they do. It's just like leadership, right? It's in essence, it's leadership in a classroom. Um, you know, a great leader depends on his people and knows that, look, I'm not good at this if not for the success of the people that I am leading. Um, you know, generals don't win wars, right? It's, I mean, they, they may come up with a plan, but they don't execute that plan. Uh, the same with an instructor. You've got to be able to teach. You've got to have that passion to teach. You've got to know what you're doing. Uh, but it's really for your students to signal whether or not you are great at your job. Yeah, so passion and knowledge, I, I like that. And, you know, I would, if, if you said, well, okay, what's the, I would agree with those two, by the way. If you said, well, what's the third one? It would probably be the ability to communicate that information in a way that that you're not only understood, but you can't be misunderstood. Right. I, and I would put the communication piece, and, and we could probably, you know, this is this is now rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. I'd put That's that true. under knowledge, right? You, mean, yeah. you need to know what you're about. Yeah. Uh, and I go into it, actually, <laughs> shameless shill here. I go into it quite a bit in my book on on what sort of the characteristics and traits of a good instructor, what you're looking for in a good instructor. Uh, and the ability to communicate is key. And here's something that that uh, I learned 
the hard way on the line at Quantico. Just because you are the one that is currently teaching somebody doesn't mean you are the right person to be teaching that person. And I know Amen. you've seen this in team teaching with Mike. Yep. Sometimes you have to say, look, I recognize that I am not getting through to them in a meaningful fashion. The information I'm putting out is accurate and it's complete and it is the right stuff for this person to hear, but they're not hearing it. Mike, you need to take over. Or you, you look at somebody else and say, hey, look, can you try teaching them this one thing or this, that thing and the other? And sometimes it's somebody else's approach, somebody else's demeanor, somebody else's vocal tones or instructional methodology, whatever it might be, that's going to ring the bell with that person. Um, and it's not a, a slight on you as the instructor. The fact that you recognize that it was a potential issue and you fix that issue, um, it, it, that that's what reflects on you as an instructor. And I think some instructors have a difficult time getting out of their own way on a variety of, of issues. And that's that's one of them that I've seen quite a bit. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And uh, yeah, I, I, I've seen that in action. You know, I'll I'll tell somebody something and I'm like, see that they're not creating it. I'll tap Mike on the shoulder and I'm like, hey, bro, <laughs> you see the way that guy's standing? He's like, yeah, what'd you tell him? And I t I'll say, you know, I told him to get athletic, you know, blah, blah, blah weight evenly distributed on the balls of his feet. Here's why that's important, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he's just not getting it. Mike will go over there and say one thing, you know, and they'll <laughs> fix it. Right. And it just happens that way. I mean, uh, and like I said, I had some great guys that I worked with. Will Bethards was up there. He was on uh, Top Shot a couple of times um, and a couple other, you know, national world champions on the line that you may or may not have ever heard of. Um, and it was just great to watch them work, you know, to really watch them work. Because I had all the theory in the world. By the time I got to Quantico, I had my doctorate. And I'd been teaching for a while, you know, at the Vermont Police Academy. I'd been an FBI firearms instructor for over a decade. I'd been teaching, you know, I started teaching karate when I was 15. I mean, I'd done a lot of time. And when I got there, I felt like all of that had basically been my ticket to ride this bus. You know, that had bought me, you know, entree to the show where I could watch true masters of the craft uh, and, and hopefully absorb, you know, some small percentage of what they were doing. Yeah, I... I, I... I like the uh, passion, knowledge, and you said you had role communications in there. One of the things, though, some people will poo-poo on, like, curriculum development. Like, oh, man, let's send freaking Jones. You know, Jones can't teach. We're going to send Jones to do curriculum development this quarter. And really, that's where so much of it really comes together uh, as far as designing a curriculum that achieves a certain end state. Or am I overstating that, TC? What, you, what are your thoughts on developing the curriculum? curriculum that you teach well curriculum development obviously is a, is a different skill set than instruction yes right? uh, you can be the world's greatest instructor and not have the first idea on how to develop curriculum the good news about curriculum development at least in any larger organization is it's a multi-person task you'll have subject matter experts and you'll have curriculum development experts and they can get in a room and they can go back and forth and you can develop a really solid curriculum as long as you have again passion and knowledge in that room uh, and the ability, obviously, as you pointed out, to communicate. <clears throat> Far too often, I, I have seen, and especially in the, Miro, the military and in the FBI, you get people that, well, they can't cut it, as the Marines say, in the fleet. They can't cut it out uh, on, in line units. So we got to get we got to put them somewhere. Um, they're not bad enough to chapter out of the military or fire or throw them out. We got to do something with them. Uh, put them in training. Right. I mean, that's it, it happens far more often than it should. Oh, yeah. And law enforcement's rife with it from what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it just it it's really too bad. I mean, we had people in the bureau. I don't know if I talked to you about this before. We called them hall walkers uh, up at FBI headquarters that they would get put up there and wouldn't be given an office. You know, wouldn't have a desk anywhere. They would have some nominal task, but their boss recognized that they just had a dud on their hands. And that person would just wander around the halls of FBI headquarters all day uh, until, you know, finally they would have some, some tasking would, would drift their direction. Um, happily, most bureaucracies will, you know, shuffle those folks off or they'll get the message and get gone. But it can be a, a really bad set of circumstances if you get people who are really bad at their jobs into instructional positions or worse yet, developing curriculum on their own. Um, you know, I saw a lot of curriculum in the FBI, for example, that was, well, we've always done it this way. So we're going to continue to do this this way. So innovation was a, a real struggle. And so what we tended to have was people that would get into these positions where they could make substantive changes to the curriculum and move the ball forward. 
but they would get locked into a mindset of, well, that's how we did it back in the day. And good enough for them. By God, it's good enough for me. And it's good enough for these new agents. Um, that, that can be a problematic position in my mind. It, it certainly can be a stiltifying and, and, uh, position. It can, it can really lock you into a hidebound approach to your training and you don't end up being very cutting edge any longer if, if that's your approach. And if you get people that have that mindset into the wrong positions. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, dogma is always a problem and, and large bureaucracies like that, the military or, or certainly any, any government entity is going to be rife with that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's a hard paradigm to break. It's a very hard paradigm to break and it can last generation after generation. Um, you know, I think it can be much more devastating in a smaller organization because you don't have as many checks and balances, uh, especially if you have people that just create bad curriculum and then just stick with that. Um, but it's really, really hard to change. I mean, I took several classes knowing that I wanted to have an impact on the FBI's approach to firearms instruction. I took several classes in my doctoral coursework on organizational change. You know, how do you get a large bureaucracy to turn? How do you, you know, wheel the ship of state about, if you will? And it's no joke. I mean, it's there are people that spend their lives studying that and and writing on it and doing research on it, and it's not easy to do. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I went to the the FBI Academy to teach firearms, and I decided, you know what? I, I found out quickly. Okay, I'm, I've got a real uphill battle because I really wanted to get us moving towards a direction where we were teaching gunfighting. You know, obviously you got to do the qualification courses to insulate the bureau from lawsuit because that's all a qualification course really is. I said, but that doesn't, that's not gunfighting. We need to teach gunfighting. We need to teach people how to actually fight with this tool because you don't ever need a gun until you desperately need a gun, right? I mean, then, yeah. then really there's not a whole lot else that will supplant that need. And I really had, a, I, I smacked right into a bureaucratic brick wall. So I said, all right, I'm going to try and find a chink in this armor. I'm going to try and move one thing. And I decided that the one thing I was going to change was the hackathorn fumble, as we, <laughs> we used to call it, which was the uh, mag change with retention, you would call it in, a, in competitive circles, with a double stack magazine. Because what we were teaching was uh, when time, distance, and cover allowed, you would pull your weapon into a you know position where you could reload, draw your spare magazine, change magazines at the gun, take the now partially filled magazine, replace it on your belt or in your pocket and then go back to guns. And my point to that was, look, you know, that used to be the rule in competitive shooting. And we figured out pretty quickly that that just isn't going to work. Magazines go flying under stress. Um, and it's slower. It's just slower. I said, let's change that to drop the mag, do a mag change and get back to it. Plus it's exactly the same mag change we're teaching anyhow, only we retain the mag instead of dropping it on the deck. I said, it's, it's fewer steps, it's faster, and it's less that we have to train. And, oh, by the way, we're only training this now one day. <laughs> you know, we, we do one day of three or four hours of training on this, you know, dexterous skill set that is expected to be formed during a gun battle, um, which I would suggest to you might be a fairly stressful set of circumstances uh, to, to perform this. And, you know, Rich, I never got it changed. I ah. never, ever got it changed. And it, it was amazing to me because I would tell people, look, don't believe me. Let's go out to the range, put it on the clock, you know, put it on the clock. The, the, our defensive tactics guys were really good. Our, our, our putting handcuffs on people that don't want to be handcuffed. Mm -hmm. They were really good about, Oh, you got the new way to put handcuffs on a combative subject. Let's go to the mat. Yeah. You know, if, if your technique is better than the one we're teaching now, show me and I'm going to fight you. And, you know, of course we had these big thick neck, you know, ginormous guys. And we had the little tiny guys that moved fast as a snake. And we had all kinds of guys that cuff them. And if your new way works, well, that's the way we're going to go. Man, I could not get the firearms guys to do that. You know, I fought for five years to get that done, and I failed miserably. Ah, maybe better men than I will get it done later. Yeah, that, I think that that is a such a – we see this all the time, uh, Mike and I, going around the country training law enforcement groups, and, and that is that they forget, like, why are you firing your handgun right now? What's the context in which you would fire this handgun? I mean, I know we're on a square range and all is great. And we got our sunscreen and our water and our Copenhagen. But what is the context that you would really be doing this skill? Oh, you're shooting another human being. That's right. Then what about these other follow on tasks that, you know, put them in context as well. Cause what we often see is 
slide locks and, and they they'll do something or they'll go into admin. They'll kind of, Oh yeah, I'm out of rounds and just head goes down at the gun. It's like, no, no, dude, you were just shooting another human being. Let's stay in that. We'll marinate in that stew for just a minute longer. Yeah. And, the, uh, the, the means becomes an ends, right? We're, yes. we're so used to spending what range time we get and most PDs don't get near enough, but what range time we get, training on a square range to punch holes in a stationary target at known distances that turns at known times. If you're, if you're really high tech um, and that becomes the ends, right? It's not yeah. fighting with this gun. It's I've got to qualify a couple times a year and then I go back to my job. Um, so yeah. getting people, like you said, out of that mindset and into a, look, this is a fight to the death. Uh, let's stay in that mindset that you know, changing people's perspective is, is very difficult on a micro scale and on a macro scale. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think we, this could be the entire show right here because uh, obviously I think we're on the same page with this and many of our viewers watching today are on the same page. I know that uh, many of them are fellow instructors as well. Like Alan Kelly says, I rely on my co-instructors uh, for many of the reasons that you just pointed out. But Jesse has a question I want to throw to you. He says, TC, do you think new instructors should reach out to more experienced instructors to co-teach until they have good practices down? I don't think it's a bad idea. You know, again, define as you define good instructor. Um, I don't necessarily think you need to be dependent on a more experienced instructor. I think that it's a waste of resources if you don't utilize other you know, instructors. And I got to tell you, most of the instructors I know, if you reach out to them and say, look, I'm teaching a course, uh, I need to get to this point where I can teach this confidently. Would you help me out? Most of them I know will do that. You know, I mean, you know, folks like Mike will do it, but that's his business, right? So you should expect that if you're going to reach out to Mike for that sort of thing, you're going to, it, there's going to be a cost involved and, and rightfully so, right? You don't pay the plumber to bang on the pipes, right? You know, you pay the plumber to know which pipes to bang on. Uh, you pay Mike because he not, doesn't know just what to teach, but how to teach it. Um, but a lot of guys will do that. I mean, uh, I've offered Dan Brady, you know, I'd be happy to come out and co-teach with him. You know, so you get another set of eyes, an experienced set of eyes that can then provide some critique for you, some feedback. Of course, your piece of that is not only to get that person to help you, but to listen to what they have to say afterwards. And you don't have to adopt everything, of course, but at least listen to them and take that into account. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good idea, Jesse. Yeah. And uh, let's see here. Let's go to our next question. You know, we, we were talking last night or texting as far as like the Manhar show that we did when during the horrific bloody riots of uh, South Africa here a few months ago. And the feedback that we got from those shows have been uh, tremendous. Um, some of the greatest feedback we've ever re received. And a lot of Americans joined because of it. As a matter of fact, I've got uh, another gentleman from South Africa I'm going to be talking to this week and uh, get him on the show to discuss some pretty important things. He reached out to me over the weekend. So I think there's a lot of lessons for us Americans in there. And I just want to, I want to touch on that with you, TC. What are some of the takeaways you, you got from that show? Well, I thought it was great that you got him. I, I really did. I thought he did an outstanding job. Um, it's a guy with a lot of formal training and experience and now some unfortunate experience. Um, you know, the old saying, a fool learns from his own experience and a wise man learns from the experience of others. I think that's sort of the, could be the subtext for title for your entire show. <laughs> But in Manhart's case, I thought it was great that she got him on here. I thought it was really great that he took the time, especially when he was actually sitting on the line uh, working and defending his neighborhood uh, to give you and, and my fellow listeners uh, that information. It was really good stuff. Personally, I, I like to think of myself as fairly prepared for, for that sort of thing. I mean, I, I, I'm fortunate enough that I've been able to <clears throat> you know, live in a neighborhood that's safe, in a city that's safe, in a state that's safe. Um, as I define those terms, um, you know, my lifestyle has allowed me to be in a, in a very safe place, but nonetheless, I'm still prepared for those things that I like to think that I'm prepared for those things that I didn't think of that I didn't plan for, you know, I never, never planned on a toilet paper shortage, for example, now that's mm -hmm. fairly innocuous, but still, um, in Manhart's case, you know, it allowed me to kind of really put a, a spotlight of his experience on my circumstance. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned when he was talking that they were really kind of a canary in the coal mine for the direction we were headed in at that moment. Um, but some of the takeaways I took from, from Manhar's uh, 
appearance on your show was one of them was most of us, regardless of want or need or whatever reason, aren't going to bug out. You know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, I got to be able to ready to bug out, ready to bug out. People just don't do it. I mean, obviously he was in an area that they had the means to leave. Um, but you, you know, you got to fight your way through it. He would have had to fight his way out of town or, or been prepared to fight his way out of town. At least um, it would have left a vast amount of his possessions and wealth, his worldly efforts, you know, come to fruition in that home uh, at the mercy of the mob, um, which most people don't want to do. Um, so I think most people won't bug out. In my case, what the only thing that would really force me to bug out that I can think of would be a, a meltdown in the power, the nuke power plant that's a few miles away. That would force me out of my home. But short of that, it's going to take an awful lot to get me out of here. So that being the case, you know, stockpile accordingly, right? I mean, you, you certainly be prepared to leave if you have to, but it, clearly from based on Manhart's experience, most people aren't going to, they're going to stand. Um, obviously if you, if you're going to bug out and I, I think Manhart did mention it a little bit, but not at any depth, you got to have a goal. Where are you going? Right. I mean, you're just going to leave. Okay. Where to, you know, in my case, I have a list of a few places and your house is on it, by the way, it's on that list. <laughs> but of Heck course yeah. you can't, <laughs> don't arrive empty handed. Of course, no. you know, you never, you never, I, I won't darken your door empty handed. And I certainly wouldn't, if I was bringing my whole family to stay for, you know, during riots. Um, Manhart's creation of a, a community of like-minded people, I thought was critical. It was absolutely critical. Now he has obvious organizational skills and experience from running his own company, but he put it to good use in the preservation of his own neighborhood. Um, and, and he created it before there was a problem, right? You, didn't, you don't wait until the riot to start making friends. He used to say in the bureau, uh, you know, during during the two in the morning in the rain during an emergency is not the time to be exchanging business cards. <laughs> um, you know, that's not when you want to meet people. That's not when you want to say, oh, are we on the same page here? Um, and that was a particular challenge for me because I generally speaking don't like people in groups. You know, I, I like individuals. Um, you know, an individual can be sublime, heroic, gracious, intelligent. Uh, people in groups are just, you know, scared herd animals and they drive me right. nuts. Um, it's a fact. So, you know, that's a challenge for me is to make connections in my neighborhood. I've done it, uh, but it's, it's, it's always been a challenge for me. Also, his plan to cover 24-7, I thought was uh, something I hadn't really, I mean, I knew it, but I never really put any thought into it. It wasn't like they could be out there from nine to five and then go home and have dinner and get a good night's sleep. Somebody had to be on that line in a meaningful way all day, all night, every day while the problem was going on. That creates a manning issue, right? You yeah. got to have the people to do it. It creates a logistics issue because you have to supply those people with, you know, water, food, shade, um, heat if it's cold outside, um, bathroom breaks. I mean, there's all these things that you have to consider that go into what he was doing that I hadn't really put a whole lot of thought into. So I was, I was really appreciative of that. And it's all stuff I knew. I mean, you know, anybody who's ever had a leadership position, particularly in the military knows that these are the, the practical matters that you have to deal with. And the old saying goes, right. Uh, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. That's right. Well, Manhart continuously talked logistics. And the last thing I think I took away from him talking was communications. Communications is critical in a situation like that, especially because he had multiple response responsibilities in multiple locations he had to worry about. And if you can't communicate, well, then everybody's just their own little individual pillbox and they're not operating in any kind of an organizational structure. And you can't really maximize your personnel and your assets uh, if you can't communicate in order to concentrate force at the point of need. Um, and so his communication that, as I recall, was largely based on cell phones. But that, to me, is, you know, that's, that's, that's a thin line because cell phones get knocked out all the time for a variety of reasons. And, of course, there's the one is none and or two is one and one is none concept. Yeah. As it turns out, my neighbors that I, that I have connections with, we all have kids about the same age. We've all bought our kids walkie-talkies to play with. We've all bought the same walkie-talkie. Mm -hmm. you know, it just worked out that way. Well, as it happens, I've only got, a, a, you know, 150 yards I have to worry about in my immediate circle. Those walkie-talkies are more than sufficient for that. Yeah. So between cell phones, walkie talkies, but communication is critical. And uh, Manhart's appearance on your show really underlined that. Yeah, there was a, a lot of things that I read and I don't remember where I got a, some of this stuff from. So forgive me up front, but uh, 
from others that were in the set. And we have several members of the American Warrior Society that live in um, South Africa and were reporting into me. So some of the information I got from them, some of the information I read online, but some of it was with one community group. It was a retired uh, South African lieutenant colonel that took over. And he was like, uh, first thing we're going to do is s establish some rules. Okay. So I think they all voted him to be in charge. And it's like, okay, fine. So here's what we're going to do. Take all the plates and any identifying markings off your vehicle. Okay. Some of the things that we may have to do cannot be identified. Do not take a photograph or a video of anything at any time while we're doing what we're doing. Uh, hoodies and baseball hats and stuff like that. I was like, wow. Okay. And then creating the, uh, you know, any, any infantryman worth his salt will tell you that when you set up a defensive position, you have an acronym that you got to follow safe and uh, S for safe is security. You got to set out security. First thing, as soon as you set up a defensive position, security is paramount. Then you start looking at your avenues of approach. And for him, it's pretty simple. You know, I have streets that these mobs are coming down, right? And then you look at fields of fire and who's covering what field of fire and what kind of weapon are we going to employ there? Is it going to be somebody with rubber bullets? And then we've got, uh, you know, TC and somebody else on long range rifles to handle anybody with long guns. And then finally, you know, you're going to talk about entrenchments. Are we going to get behind Jersey barriers? Are we actually going to dig a hole? Are we going to get behind cars? What are we doing? And they really treated it a lot like, just like you would in an infantry situation. So uh, there's so many lessons to learn. And your point about, are you bugging out? Or are you bugging in? And everybody has this, oh, this is my bug out rig. And this is my bug out vehicle. And, we're, and I, my question always is, where are you bugging out to, bro? Where are you going? No. Well, yeah, we're going to bug out. We're going to go to the woods. I hear you. And when your wife or your daughter hits her menstrual period, then we're going to do, you know, pine cones don't work for that kind of stuff. So where are you going and why are you going? I think a lot of times we're probably better served by bugging in than bugging out. Although it's situation dictates, I get it. But um, I think so many people have this bug out fantasy TC. I hate to say it like that, but if you don't have a place you're going, and of course my house is a great place, you know, during the stuff last year, I know Justin Carroll was talking about him and his uh, girlfriend coming here. C. Glenn was talking about coming here, uh, you know, with Dr. Fuller here, you know, we'll push up some berms and, and really get to get to getting. Yeah, but then you got to think long term, right? What are you going to eat? What are we going to eat next week? If I'm on yep. the road, you know, if I've got a bug out, if I've got to walk to your house, well, that's going to take me a couple of months. Yeah, I can't carry that much food, you know. Nope. So, uh, and as I like to tell my wife, fat kids got to eat, man. <laughs> you know, fat kids got to eat. So, uh, you know, bugging in is a lot easier because I can store a lot more stuff in my garage than I can in my backpack. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of lessons to learn from say, uh, you know, the Rhodesian bush war where you had these farmers that were isolated in the middle of nowhere. And they had these beautiful, everybody knew where the, where the white farmer was that the terrorists were going to attack. And some of the really low cost ways that they handle that, it's the same thing that the farmers in South Africa are doing. You could do a lot with chicken wire and barbed wire and stuff like that to create uh, some things in your yard, which from a distance doesn't detract from the beauty of your house, but it, it will really protect you. So I encourage you to look into that and uh, maybe get ahead of it a little bit. I know that we've taken some of those measures here at my house to harden our home and, and maybe not be a bad idea with what's going on in the country these days. No. And, that, and even if you're not in time of civil strife, I mean, planting rose bushes under your windows, lighting up areas around your house. Um, you know, I tell my neighbors all the time, I don't have to have an impregnable home. I just have to be less attractive than your home and they laugh at me ha, ha, ha. i'm like yeah no i'm serious you know, serious. if the guy looks at my house and says well i can get in that window but i have to crash through that you know four foot rose bush to get to it and under that you know motion sensor light or i can go two doors down and then go through the exact same window in this subdivision without the rose bush and without the lights where am i going exactly you know criminals don't tend to be diligent, hardworking folk, you know, they are low hanging fruit predators, right? They're not looking for a fight. They're looking for a victim. Uh, don't be that victim, regardless of the situation. 
I totally agree with that, man. So let's talk about, you know, here, the, it, let's bring it back home. We talked about South Africa, TC. There's some micro issues and some macro issues here in American affairs. What worries you the most in the coming months and years? Well, right off the top, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm concerned with inflation. You know, I'm, I'm concerned that we may be headed towards a road of hyperinflation. I mean, you know, Reagan said a long time ago that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the, you know, some of these folks are spending money like drunk sailors, but that's actually kind of a disservice to drunken sailors because at least they're spending their own money. Uh -huh. um, you know, Congress is throwing money out the door faster than they can print it. I mean, trillions and trillions of dollars. I mean, look at what our national debt was when President Obama took over versus what it is today. You know, it's more than tripled. I mean, that's insanity. And to think that there is no long-term impact on our economic system by doing that is ridiculous. I mean, there's a reason no one's done it before because it's a bad idea. Uh, but, you know, these people think in terms of election cycles and there's at least one political party of our two major political parties right now that benefits from chaos and they've recognized it, unfortunately. So create chaos and suddenly you're a viable party again. I've said that before on here. Um, I'm, I'm concerned on a macro issue that we're, we're being perceived as weakening on the world stage. Uh, there's, there's a very real Pax Americana that's been going on for a long time now. And, uh, you know, I, you can't be a student of history and not know that America will eventually leave the world stage uh, in terms of being, you know, a major player. It's, it's going to happen. All empires crumble. Um, I think the best we can hope for is to exit like England did, you know, <laughs> gracefully yeah. and, you know, not collapse and not create too much, strife but let's face it england withdrawing from the world stage and, and downsizing their empire did cause a lot of destabilization it did cause a lot of rebellion it did cause a lot of war uh i think the same thing is going to happen when america retreats from the world stage eventually what i didn't want to see is it happen in you know a four-year or an eight-year presidency um, because it's just too impactful it, you know it, if the u.s crashes it's going to destabilize the entire planet and it's going to have a massive impact on a lot of places. Um, there are, there are, you know, countries out there that are only held in check because the United States exists. And as soon as we don't, as soon as we're perceived as not, you know, kind of being the policeman of the world, then things are going to change. Those people are going to feel unchained. I mean, let's face it. How long ago was it that the, that Russia just grabbed up a big chunk of the Caucasus? in the Crimea, right? They just snatched up and annexed a big chunk of another country because they knew the United States wasn't going to go to war over that. They knew it. So they did it. No downside, right? And here we are five years later and no one remembers it happened. No one cares it happened. Uh, so if we start to destabilize monetarily, uh, politically, I think the ripple effects are going to be colossal and potentially catastrophic worldwide. I'm also concerned yeah. with supply chain issues. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go right ahead. You're, you're speaking my language now. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm also concerned with uh, the increasing supply chain issues we're having. Uh, and this is, of course, a, a perfect storm, right? We have COVID is, is impacting personnel all over the world. We have a federal government pursuing policies that are discouraging labor uh, from going to work. I mean, and then we have a, at least one state in the country that's making political decisions <clears throat> that are impacting the trucking industry and the shipping industry to a degree that's having an impact on the entire country. Uh, and they, and they don't care, you know, they just do what they want to do. Um, it's like dealing with my three-year-old. I just do what I want to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Except you've got one of the you know top 10 largest economies in the world in that state. And the decisions you're making are impactful across the globe. Um, let's face it. Have you seen shortages in your lifetime? Like you're seeing in the last year? No. In the United States? I mean, not at all. I've never seen it either. So those are kind of my macro issues that I'm worried about out there. And, it, you know, they all kind of circling each other. And if they all hit at the same time, we're going to have a real big problem. And it won't just be us. It'll be felt all over the world. Uh, I think that it could lead to a, a hardcore nationalist getting into office. You know, and if that happens, you know, Trump's America first policies will pale in comparison. You know, if we if we really cut off all the other countries to save ourselves, you know, good luck, folks. You know, <laughs> it's the old motto. I'm on board. Pull up the ladder. Uh, 
you know, it'll be hard times here, but it'll be hard times everywhere. And I don't yeah. think that's a good thing for anybody. Might let's stay, let, okay. let's stay on the macro. Okay. Uh, Let's stay on the macro for just a little minute longer. And I want to get to a question that Alan says, TC, what are your thoughts on China and their finances and their future and the impact on the world? You know, I, I would start by saying I'm no China expert. Um, I've really enjoyed the broadcast you've done on China lately because they've been very educational for me. Uh, China is, you know, they are now the big manufacturing country in the world, right? We've ceded that position to them. Uh, so I think it puts them in a, in a pretty strong position. <clears throat> and they've got money, but they're, they're conflicted. I think they have some serious internal conflicts between wanting to stay communist. And there are people who have vested interest in, in keeping that nation communist and the revolution of rising expectations that they're, they're seeing as people get a taste for uh, the benefits of capitalism. Right. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I work harder and I make the money, <laughs> not some guy in Beijing. Hey, that, that, that has a certain appeal. Um, you know, there's a reason why nowhere on the world in the last 150 years that the Karl Marx, the Marx and Engels policies haven't resulted in countries that are doing exceptionally well. I mean, they failed everywhere. everywhere. China was the exception, but they're not a fully communist country anymore. I would argue. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, you know, they're, they're a huge market. They're already just their mere existence is manipulating the behaviors of people in other markets. I mean, witness how many of our sports and, and movie people now just bend over backwards not to offend the Chinese market. Um, I, I think they're really the heir apparent. When the United States cedes world leadership, I think China's going to take it. Now, does that happen in my lifetime? I hope not. Maybe it does. I don't necessarily think it'll happen violently. I also am not going to move to Taiwan anytime soon. So, um, you know, I think China has the potential for violence. You know, I think they're very much more engaged in the real politic of world affairs than we are. You know, I think their, their national mindset is more aligned with realities than we are. Um, and I think in the long term that, that wins them the battle unless something dramatic changes, you know, now the good news is on the other side of the scale is us, it's Russia, India, you know, there, there are other big players out there that can counterbalance them and they know it, but, they're getting stronger and stronger. And, and the Chinese, to their credit, they don't think in four-year blocks. No. They don't think in eight-year blocks. They think in 100-year blocks. Um, you know, it's until we start thinking along those lines, we're just, we're outgunned. Uh, we're playing checkers. They're playing chess. I agree. Which which is another thing. Like, I, I need to read more about what's going on with this undeclared war on the border with China and India. Because that could go... That could go uh, bad in a heartbeat um but the skirmishes that have been going on all along the border is, is with uh you know they're not you're not getting uh the our american news media is not talking about it you got to really search out for what's going on and if they were ever going to grab taiwan now's the time to do it you know why did we not do anything when the russia began its rough wooing of the crimea well there's not a whole lot there there's not a whole lot of our interest there but with Taiwan and 60 to 70 percent of all the the chips being manufactured are coming out of Taiwan. The, of course, we're talking about the the computer chips. We have a strategic interest there. It's not just a little island nation that we can write off and let China gobble it up. Um, to, to lose that would be a, a huge blow to to the United States. So yeah, I agree with you, China. It could go hot at any month. They're making some plays on some islands off the coast of Japan. China is and. If, if uh, I just don't know that this administration is up for the task, I don't know that any administration might be up for the task, but definitely not this administration. What do you think? I, I think you've got a, a good point. I mean, they're, they're very absorbed in solving their own problems and in and, and defense of the media here, uh, not covering, like you said, China and India. AOC might have tweeted something nasty today. And that's much more important than what's going on in, uh, you know, that the, there might be a shooting war between two of the world's largest populations. I, I really think you have unreasonable expectations, Rich. That, uh, yeah, we're talking about I, that's a, I, I'm so, so sorry to interrupt you, but that's something I never considered. The fact that we're talking about almost three billion people might end up in a shooting war. If that doesn't strike terror to your heart, I mean, we're talking about what 30 or 40 percent of the world population, maybe more. That could be in a shooting war just yeah. over some little disputed land along some rocky border. 
Crazy. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is India, it's a lot of people in a fairly small geographic area. They got to go somewhere. I mean, it's not like they're, you know, the Chinese took a very uh, hardline approach to population control, what, back in the 70s. And mm -hmm. they're just now kind of starting to alter that uh, approach. India hasn't done that. They, they just haven't. So you've got, what, a billion, over a billion, billion and a half people in that relatively small area. They're yeah. going to keep going. They got to be fed. They got to be watered. They got to go somewhere. Um, you know, the problem that they're going to run into is everywhere they can go has nuclear weapons. Yeah. You know, they can fight Pakistan. Uh, but that's not going to get them a ton of land. Bhutan, well, that doesn't get you a bunch of land. China has a lot of land. Mm -hmm. But China is going to take umbrage to you trying to slice off a, a piece of that. Um, I, I could easily see them duking it out. And now you got two massive populations with nuclear weapons and huge standing armies, you know, that, that, that doesn't bode well for a lot of people. Before we get into the macro, the micro issues that are kind of keeping TC Fuller's uh, bandwidth occupied, I want to talk just briefly, if I could, TC, about why are two self-defense oriented guys, two sh shooters, former, uh, you know, self-defense, whatever, why are we even caring? And, and to me, it, it boils down to this. It's like, you know, we live in an apartment block that is the United States. And I, I have to worry about the fire that's that's going on three or four down. I can't just keep, like you said, polishing brass on the Titanic and, and think this doesn't affect me. For, for So for those that are just, yeah, but why are we talking about the, the China issue? And how does that affect the self-defense problems that American Warrior Show has normally uh, covered? Can you discuss some of that as to why we need to keep this on a radar screen? Sure. I mean, I, I think it'll feed a very nice segue into those micro issues that you mentioned. Uh, a war between those two organizations, let's, let's say those two countries go to war. Uh, one, you know, there are huge markets for American goods. Well, now it, we're shipped, we're talking about potentially shipping American goods into a war zone. That, that becomes very, very problematic, very, very difficult, and has a, an unavoidable impact on our economy. Um, now the good news is maybe we sure ship less food and more guns, but you know, we'll still ship something to them, but I think it's going to impact our economy. Uh, two, the global economy is so intermingled now that you can't take markets like India and China, have them go to war with each other and not expect it to have global impact on the economies of world of, of the whole world. Um, and, and look at, you know, Syria and Iraq are relatively small countries, but look at the refugee crisis those two places created by having civil wars. Um, and the impact that it's had here with the Afghan, Afghani uh, refugees showing up here, Syrian refugees showing up here, and all over Europe. Um, <clears throat> you remember El Salvador back in the 80s. They were having a civil war that was just brutal for a long, long time. And that had you know, the effect of creating an El Salvadoran diaspora that shot all over Central America and even reached the United States. Uh, you're, if you have two countries with the populations of India and China going at it, you're going to have a lot of people trying to get the hell out of the way. Yeah. And they're going to try and go anywhere they can. Some of those people will inevitably land here. Not all of those people that land here will be good people. Um, so some of those people might be forced by temperament or circumstance or both to become violent criminal actors. And it doesn't take a whole lot, right? I mean, it, it, you may get the one outlier that tries to stick you up in Tennessee. That doesn't mean it's not impactful, right? It doesn't mean people go, oh, wow, that's weird that an Afghani tried to kill Rich Brown. Um, but in the moment, Rich Brown has to deal with that problem. That's right. <laughs> and, I, you know, we were just in New Jersey a couple weeks ago uh, on Fort Dix doing some training. And I remember one of the guys were like, uh, hey, you know, Rich, make sure you all lock your rental car up. And I said, oh, OK, it was, we got ninety eight hundred Afghani refugees on Fort Dix. And they're not really being watched as closely as they should. They're wandering off into the communities. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, some, sometimes they just wander off and nobody knows where they're at. And they weren't vetted when they got here and they aren't vetted when they're just wandering out in town. So again, to your point, how the macro affects the micro, right? Right. And, you know, and, and let's be honest. Okay. So there's 10,000 of these folks at Fort Dix. 99% of them are probably good, honest, hardworking people that just by circumstance ended up in Fort Dix. They didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. but there they are. Not normally criminal actors, but 
So they may not have the temperament for it. Some of them inevitably will be criminal actors or will have that temperament for it. But some of them now might be forced by circumstance, right? I mean, how hungry do you let your kids get before you break into a car? Oh, yeah. How how desperate do you have to be before you're stealing? How 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 many days can your kids go without food before you try to mug somebody? Um, now, I'm not saying that these people in Fort Dix are, are being starved to death. What I am saying is when you become a refugee, things change, right? Your perspectives change. You have sunk far down Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Self-actualization isn't on the radar anymore. It's food and shelter time. Um, and, you know, you're used to more hardship than maybe Miss Lisa is. Uh, although having been married to you for 25 plus years, I'm sure she has some familiarity with the term hardship, but you're used to more deprivation and, and dealing with a little bit more suffering, being hungry, cold, wet, and miserable than, than your kids, right? Mm -hmm. What about your grandkids? So somebody with a four or five year old and that kid hasn't eaten in three days. You haven't eaten in three days. That's one thing. Your kid hasn't eaten in three days. And this guy walking down the street in a nice suit, you know, with his cell phone and his Rolex watch. Feed your kid for a week. Yeah. You know, maybe I go hit him over the head. There's also the cultural problems that, you know, uh, Douglas <clears throat> yes. Murray wrote an excellent book, The Death of Europe. And he, but to your point, TC, about how a little civil war in Syria le led to Europe being overrun by what some have called the soft uh, invasion and how Europe will never, ever be the same because of that. A civil war in Syria that led to this, you know, and when they, when some of these Af uh, Syrian men or, or Muslim men would see women that were barely clothed in a Western country, they just assumed that they were prostitutes and, you know, they were sexually assaulting them. And th so there's some things that culturally we don't mix well. <laughs> and I think that, that, you know, in a, Benetton sort of 80s uh, world, people have a hard time understanding that. Well, you know, the good idea fairies come along and they think, well, it's be a good idea to help these folks. And I think we can all get on board with the idea that, look, we don't want these refugees to die and starve in the streets. But at the same time, there's only so much room in the lifeboat. And if we're going to be bringing people on, I think there's something to be said for assimilating folks and, and acclimatizing them to the cultural norms of the culture they are entering. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, I hear a lot of people say, oh, all cultures have value. All cultures are the same. No, they're not. No, they're I'm not. sorry. I just, I, I, you know, I, I don't mean to offend people, but some cultures ha are just broken. And, you know, for example, I've watched the videos of women being stoned for adultery. And, you know, I've watched people videos and I, actually I've been in Chop Chop Square in Saudi Arabia. I've seen the videos of people losing a hand because they steal. Um, the genital mutilation that goes on in some cultures uh, of females, you know, uh, clitoral circumcision. You know, these are cultural norms in some places that I would say have no room in the modern society. Uh, some people disagree. Well, you take thousands of folks that have one attitude and dump them into a pot with thousands of folks that have a different attitude or millions of folks with a different attitude, there will be conflict. There will be cultural clashes. And some people deal with those clashes by sitting down and having a conversation others by picking up a bat and hitting somebody in the head. So mm -hmm. Don has a great point here. TC he says there are only nine meals between mankind and anarchy. That's Alfred Henley Lewis's quote. Uh, and I, man, I tell you what, that is so spot on because your point about, you know, you may be okay, but at what point are, are you going to see the swollen bellies of your children and go, Hey, it's game time. Yeah. Time to time to pick up a, a rifle. And I'll say another thing that you pointed out, like life inside of a refugee camp. You know, most Americans cannot even conceive of that. But I would I would say that during my time uh, managing disaster relief operations with the Red Cross, you know, I've been responsible for multiple shelters and have to tour my shelters and put out fires and find, you know, who got arrested for assaulting who in the shelter and why is the food taking time to get here and who do we need to or the nurse is not caring for the sick. And you don't want to be in that situation, folks. I'm going to tell you right now, the Red Cross workers, that they're amazing human beings, but they're not supermen and women. And life inside of a shelter is not something that you want to do. So I say that almost to go back to something when we were talking about, I'm going to bug out, Rich. Roger that. Well, guess what? During your bug out process, you may be diverted into a shelter at some point against your will. And uh, there you may, you'll find 
health and comfort, but you may be uh, separated from your families uh, for the duration of shelter, asked to perform work as part of your stay there. So uh, I think that people need to, to consider what may be in store for some sort of breakdown like that. That's no, true. Um, and let's face it, if you were born in a Palestinian uh, refugee camp in southern Jordan, and that's where you lived your whole life, you are much better suited to living in a refugee camp than an American tech worker who's lived in the suburbs his whole life and now suddenly finds himself in a refugee camp. Um, you're just not prepared. It's it's a lot like, you know, folks, you, know, you take a guy like me and you put me in a prison. I'm not socially prepared for that environment. Um, I haven't grown up in that environment. I've spent a lot of time around those people, mm -hmm. but that doesn't prepare me for the actual fact of living in that environment. Um, so there's something to be said for you. It's a lot more impactful for the average American than it is for the average person who has already grown up in that set of circumstances. Yeah. So. Which has tiptoed us into the micro issues. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, TC. Uh, well, micro issues that I concern, that, that concern me, uh, you know, you start to see the impact of these macro issues, right? Our, the cost of living for the average person is going up. It's going to go up and it's going up already. There's a gas station right outside my neighborhood and gas the day of the election was $1.87 a gallon. Uh, this morning when I brought my, took my kids to school, it was three nineteen a gallon. Now I'm fortunate that I can absorb that kind of cost difference. I mean, my wife has a work car, so her company pays for her car and maintenance and fuel. I don't drive a whole lot. Uh, I have a motorcycle for getting around. I have, you know, vehicles for when I have to take my kids places. But I fully recognize I'm not in the, the, the average when it comes to that. I mean, what about the single mom with two kids working a couple of jobs? Yeah. Well, you take gas prices and you raise them 75% in a year. That, that has an impact. I'm sorry. And it does. And then when you start looking at, well, what impact does that have on the trucking industry? Because they're paying more fuel for fuel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to charge their customers. Uh, yeah, you think they're just going to eat that or they're going to pass that along to you? It doesn't vanish. Um, you know, so these costs are going to go up. They're talking about, they're going to have to raise taxes. They're going to dance around it and they're going to talk about it all they want, but they're going to raise taxes and not just on you and I and our income taxes, but on all these folks that are producing things. Well, all these folks that are producing things aren't just going to eat it. They're already working on thin margins as it is. They're going to pass it on to us, the consumer. So we're going to see the cost of everything go up. Um, Can we talk about that? Because your, your point about, and I meant to talk about this a moment ago. Uh, most Americans, and I'm talking about that sweet, juicy part of the bell curve. They don't. They hear million, billion, trillion, and it's just it's just words. Million, billion, trillion. Let, let's put it in something. And I know I've said this before, so bear with me. You know, a million seconds takes uh, a, basically eleven days. In eleven days, you will reach a million seconds. And you'll hit your billionth second on this planet when you've lived about 31.7 years. So around your 32nd birthday, you will have lived on this planet a billion seconds. Congratulations. You will arrive at your trillionth second when you're 32,000 years old. And if we were paying off our national debt, which is over $29 trillion as we sit right now, and it's going up as we're speaking so let's just round it up to 30 trillion, which will probably be by the end of the year. 30 trillion. If we paid that off a dollar a second, we wouldn't pay that off for 951,000 years, almost a million years. It's going to take for 30 trillion seconds or 30 trillion dollars to be paid off. And that is we're, and we're, we're, we're going to keep growing. So I think that this is a crisis that we have to, to confront and people that say, well, deficits don't matter, Rich, you don't understand. We can print our way. We can print all the money we want because we have the keys to the printing press and these bonds that we're issuing, they're, they're written on you know us dollars. I hear what you're saying, man, but the devaluation of currency is exactly what led to one of the contributing factors to the fall of Rome, the debasement of their currency, which is exactly what we're doing. Or am I misreading history? No, you're right. And, and the last part that kills me is <clears throat> Ostensibly, those 650 people up on Capitol Hill running the show know these things. They're supposed to be smart. Well, how can two knuckleheads like you and I figure this out? And you know, or what are we missing? Um, and it's I think it's your your point is well made. It's easy to just get overwhelmed by those numbers and go, holy crap, a million years to pay off this debt. Well, that ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, so I'm not going to worry about it. I can't control that. I'm going to check out. I'm going to self-disenfranchise, right? 
Well, that's why I worry more about the micro issues. Okay. What does that mean in, in practical terms? Well, it means I'm paying, you know, six bucks a pound for chicken when I was paying three bucks a pound for chicken a year and a half ago. It means that uh, I'm paying a hundred dollars to fill the tank on my truck instead of $50 to fill the tank on my truck. Um, you know, this is, this is where you start talking about real world impact on real people. Uh, you know, companies are not going to be able to absorb all these costs and all these mandates that are coming down from our, our political overlords, as they clearly think they are now. Uh, yeah, so companies are going to start going on under. You know, you're, you're paying so much, you're flooding the market with so much money that your labor has just become almost non-existent. I mean, how many places have you gone in the last month that have curtailed their hours or closed down completely because they cannot get somebody to come to work? Let's talk about that real quick, man, because uh, Lisa and I, we were coming back from Ohio yesterday, and to fill my truck, it cost $95 and some change. And again, I still had several gallons in the truck. So, I mean, if I'd been at E, it would have definitely cost over $100 just to fill up my gas tank. And then we go to, um, I think it was Wendy's, and there was a, they kept changing the dollar amount that they were willing to pay to to have somebody work there. And it was like, you could see where they'd put a new sticker on. I said, and I think it was like $16 an hour just for somebody to be a fry cook. And then we went into a convenience store and I know I'm, this is anecdotal, but you know, I know that people watching or listening to us, TC will, will, will appreciate this. When we were in New Jersey two weeks ago, the guy's like, I don't have any change to give you. And then he pointed to a sign that says, you know, we have a change shortage in the United States. We're in Ohio coming back. Same thing. There's a sign there and the woman's like, I have no change to give you. Well, she owed me 81 cents. She's like, you want to round it up? I'm like, round it up to what? <laughs> I, I'm literally, I'm like, give me my 20 back and I'll pay for it with credit. You know, just, me just give your company 81 cents. I mean, I give me a dollar. How's that sound? Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's like, no, I don't want to round it up, whatever that means just to your company. Throw a little more money in your pocket. So literally give me my 20 back. I'll pay for it with a credit card because they just did not have change. And I think all these, any one of these things is a, is a no big deal. It's a nothing burger. But when you put them in aggregate, you go, we have problems. Yeah. And, and, and these are, like I said, this is where I want to talk about the micro issues more than the macro issues. Because the macro issues, it's way too easy to just get buried by them, just get overwhelmed by them. Um, Scott Douglas in his book series, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, called it an SEP field, somebody else's problem field. The problem was so big, it was so massive, I couldn't handle it, so I couldn't even see it. It was just invisible to me. It was somebody else's problem. Um, but the fact that you're paying twice as much for gas, that that's something you can get your head around, <clears throat> right? Because that impacts what you can do and where you can go and how you can do it. The fact that your grocery bill is going to go from, say, $200 a week for a family of four to $300 or $350 a week, that is a real-world impact you can understand and get your head around. Um you know, I, I also worry about the destruction of the value of investments. You know, one of the things I'm living on uh, now is my 401k, right? From or it's TSP is what it was with the right. FBI, but you know, it's it's a government 401k. Well, it's a fixed amount, right? And it goes up and down a little bit based on the market. Well, if you devalue the currency, let's say that that amount is X. Well, the buying power today is X. You devalue my currency, that amount doesn't change, but now its buying power is one half X. Well. That's got to last me until the day I die, which will hopefully be far, far, far in the future. Uh, but now all of a sudden my buying power, my purchasing power is reduced by 50%, you know, because I can't get a loaf of bread for a dollar. Now I'm paying two or I'm paying 250. Um, social security is a fixed amount. A lot of people in this country, that is their entire retirement is social security. Well, if your social security check every month is $2,000, today it can buy $2,000 worth of stuff. Six months from now, it's only buying fifteen hundred dollars worth of stuff. Well, that's impactful, right? Because some of that stuff is food, <laughs> shelter, yeah. you, you know, uh, home values. The biggest investment most people have in this country is the purchased home and the appreciation of that home and the the equity in that home. Well, if housing prices, you know, they're not they don't look like they're on par to, to plummet anytime soon. But if the value of the dollar that goes into that home, you know, say your home is worth $500,000, but that $500,000 was only able to buy $250,000 worth of stuff in a year. Well, you've just lost 50% of the value of your home. And that's a little harder to understand, you know, for, for the average person that may or may not be economically sophisticated enough to kind of get their head around that. But these are real world impacts that are going to 
go across our society. And these are just three quick examples. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really going to have an impact. And it's really, really, really going to be bad. Uh, and, and, you know, our politicians are savvy enough to, you know, play three card Monty with facts and, and word salad and get you to kind of not notice these things. But that's the reality of what's coming down the pike, folks, if these people don't get their shit together, um, which is what we pay them to do. That's what drives me bonkers. Yeah. And if I did my job as poorly as they're doing theirs, I'd be in jail. <laughs> it wouldn't be a that's matter true. of moving my job. They'd put me under the prison where they'd have to pump in daylight. Uh, but these people get reelected. And yes, they this, do. Yeah, all of this is going to feed into those additional social pressures, right? There's all kinds of social pressures going on now, anyhow. And now you're going to add fiscal instability and economic near chaos into an already volatile situation with COVID, with, with you know, mandates from on high that some people are championing and some people are resisting. And now you're going to make, you know, people hungry and make their money go away and make the shortages on the shelves. Uh, and then let's not even consider the fact that some of this chaos might be encouraged by other nation state actors that may have information campaigns or may not. I don't know. I certainly would if I was, you know, a, a adversarial nation of the United States. Yep. Uh, and what's worse is our politicians are encouraging it. I mean, we've got politicians that are actually encouraging some of this shenanigans. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very volatile set of circumstances that makes for a very potentially chaotic situation. You know, some places are worse than others right now, but I think it, we're going to see echoes of this across the country in the next couple of years. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Don says our current debt issuance is designed to be rolled over, that is refinanced, not, uh, not serviced or paid off. And if, if you said if you did that as an individual, you'd be arrested for fraud. It's totally true. Yeah. Uh, Rudy says, good morning, guys. Jay Fujimoto is out there in Hawaii. Good morning, Jay. And uh, Dr. Gordon Bodson is on. Says, almost missed you. Good morning. Coin number 1688 up in Ohio. So um, let's talk, TC, about mindset. Um, tell me about mindset. How do you create it? How do you maintain it? What are your thoughts on that? You know, that's, that is a, a very interesting mindset. Uh, well, to me, how do I define mindset? It's your self perceptions and beliefs around yourself that kind of drive your own behavior and your mental attitude. Right. Um, I think it was author Corbin Lang had uh, four elements of mindset, growth mindset, or four types of mindset growth, self-efficacy, sense of belonging and relevance. Uh, but they all kind of speak to the idea that it's your, what's going on in your head. Okay. You know, and a lot of that is based on your beliefs. If you believe that you are not athletic and you're a couch potato, but that you're really, really good at uh, medal of honor. Well, that's, that's your mindset, right? <laughs> okay. That's your mindset. I think a lot of the folks that make up your audience have a different mindset. Uh, they may also be good at Medal of Honor. I don't know. But uh, I don't think that's their primary mindset, right? Their primary mindset is to to push back the frontiers of ignorance, to um, be better every day than they were the day before at whatever it is they choose to be better at. And in the case of your audience, I think it's taking care of themselves, self-efficiency. Um, <clears throat> I think mindset can be trained by others. I mean, I promise you, I didn't know you then, but I promise you that your mindset the day before you showed up to basic training and the day versus the mindset you had the day you graduated basic training were vastly different. Mine were, um, you know, but that wasn't the last school you went to, right? When you're in the military, for example, I mean, they spent a lot of time in my case, I know beating me over the head about mindset, right? Went to basic, went to jump school, went to air assault school, went to ranger school, went to I mean, school after school after school where they're beating you over the head about mindset. And when you're going to ultimately ask somebody to, charge a machine gun nest with armed with a K bar and a bad attitude. You probably should have a good mindset on there, <laughs> but it, it can be trained, but you can also do it yourself. I mean, visualization is critical, right? You get that coaching, get that mentoring, get that training where you can. But the reality is you're going to spend a lot more time in your own head than other people are going to spend stomping around in your own head. So you've got to be able to kind of look at those problems, address those problems. And that's why I mentioned visualization, you know, how am I going to deal with that problem? Whatever the problem is, you know, the problem might be I've got a loose, you know, nail pop in the ceiling of my stairwell and I can't reach it easily to fix. Okay. I've got a, got a mindset that says I don't give a shit or do I have a mindset that no, 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 we're not going to have that. I'm going to fix that. Um, and how am I going to fix that? What drives me to fix that? Um, 
the, the problems could be just about anything you want to come up with. Obviously, the problems pondered by the AWS membership and, and viewers uh, are a little bit more impactful, you know, potentially devastating. Um, but you got to think about it and put some thought into it. The first time you think about how am I going to deal with this crazed meth addict with a knife coming at me at two in the morning, it shouldn't be at two in the morning with the crazed knife wielding meth head is coming at you. You know, you should consider that problem and how you're going to deal with it and what your mindset is going to be prior to that incident. It makes it a lot easier to deal with the incident in the now. Um, but mindset is, is something I think you really have to work on all the time. You have to really ponder, ponder it. You have to put some thought into it. Uh, in my book, I talk about, you know, deadly force issues quite a bit. And I talk about, you got to get your mind right before the incident happens. Otherwise, you know, you could end up like uh, that tragic video of Kyle Dinkeller, where he just, he locks into a get back, get back, put the gun down, put the gun down, put the gun down, put the gun down. And he keeps saying it even after the guy's shooting at him yeah. uh, and eventually kills him, you know, because he didn't have the mindset. And I'm not saying that to denigrate Officer Dinkeller or his sacrifice. I'm using it as an example of why you should motivate yourself to have the mindset and to have those mindset conversations and training and thought processes in place uh, before the flag flies, if that makes sense. Yeah, let's talk about that real quick. I had a, I, I've never told this story before. My sister was doing a ride along with me when I was a police officer and uh, the call came out that someone had just escaped from the mental uh, ward of Blunt Memorial Hospital and was last seen walking, you know, westbound down 321. So I'm like, okay, and I see this guy, He's, he c comes out of the radio as a white male. And, I, and I'm like, okay, what does a white male wear? And I'm asking dispatch. He's got a green hoodie on or whatever. And lo and behold, that's him. I see him walking my way. I'm like, okay. I get out and uh, start talking to the guy. And here's, here's the situation. He was a former police officer that shot and killed an old man. Um, there was a domestic call. He goes there. The old man is like 80 something years old. And he starts beating the crap at him with a cane. The kid falls down. It, it's a, he's like a hoarder. So he kind of trips over the stuff. He doesn't want to shoot the old man, but he's getting literally pounded. So he sh shoots the guy one time and kills this old man. And he just could not mentally handle it and, um, end up leaving the police with a mental retirement. And, um, I had to take him back and literally, I, I talked him into the cuffs. I talked him into the car, but he would not, you know, he was going to fight the hospital staff again, unless, you know, I stayed with him as they, as they took care of him for a little bit, because I had, I guess, reached him on some level. So your point is incredibly well-made. So many people think about the shooting. They don't think about the aftermath. They don't think about the effect of taking another human being's life. How are you going to live with that? How are you going to mentally justify that? I think is incredibly important. Most people don't think about it. Uh, it, it is. And I think that's how we end up with the Vietnam vet that snaps that we all heard about growing up that, you know, has a problem. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, when I came back from uh, Afghanistan, I never talked about this publicly. Uh, you know, my agency had the attitude of great, you're back, get back to work. And there was no break. There was no, like you got back Friday, was back in the office Monday. Um, no, no approbation for what I'd done. You know, no concern about what had happened. And I had, you know, Fortunately, I had the Gulf War experience in my belt, but I, I was having dreams. I, you know, there were some incidents that occurred over there that that were impactful that, that I had to kind of get through. Um, and so I informally talked to somebody about it. And one of the things I told them was, look, I don't feel like I'm a danger to myself or others right now. I really don't. Um, you know, I'm having trouble dreaming or you know, sleeping at night. I'm a little hyper vigilant. You know, a balloon popped in a, in a restaurant I was in. A kid popped his balloon. And I hit the floor, you know, not normal behavior in a suburb, right? <laughs> in Northern Vermont. Uh, I said, I need a stitch in time because what I don't want to do is allow these small indicators of issues fester. And then 10, 15, 20 years from now, I end up naked painted blue on a water tower with a high powered rifle. Uh, mm -hmm. I said, you know, I don't want to go down that slope. I'd like to get out of this funnel as early on as possible. And, you know, the guy I talked to was a Vietnam infantry vet. And we had a lot in, a lot in common, a generation apart. And, uh, you know, we talked for probably six months and it was fine. <clears throat> you know, to this day, I still have, you know, some dreams. I have some other issues. 
I, I look at it a lot like as if you know you got shot in the ankle, right? You're just gonna have a trick ankle for the rest of your life. You just you know, this is the way it is. Um, it's just something you deal with. But you got to have that mindset. And I had, a, I think I had a really solid mindset going into my experiences in Afghanistan. Um, I certainly had a solid mindset going into the first Gulf War. Uh, but even at that, if you self-define as a good person, you've, you've grown up in the American culture where, you know, punching other kids is not considered good. And so killing another human being is certainly considered very, very bad um, when you actually do it for your country. You better have your mind right. Right. Yeah. I mean, because otherwise the potential downsides are pretty catastrophic. And if you do have your mind right, sleep like a baby. And the vast majority of the times, I if I have dreams about those days, I don't have, you know, wake up sweating, screaming nightmares. I'm like, well, it happened and we moved on. Uh, and I I like to tell myself that's because of the preparation the military gave me and because of the mindset I had going into those incidents. Um, so mindset, not only in dealing with the moment. But in dealing with the aftermath, I, I would argue is absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, uh, you know, Johnny King says it here. He says the feet won't go where the mind hasn't been first. And that's so true. You know, we everything happens twice. It happens first in the mind, then it happens in reality. And you have to put yourself in those situations ahead of time. Just And, and you may, you know what you may discover? Carrying a firearm is not the right decision for me. I know I got my concealed carry permit. I'm all excited about it. Uh, I'm finally going to take that responsibility. But in, in those exercises with yourself mentally, you may decide, you know what? Maybe taking a human being's life is not the thing for me. Maybe I can accomplish my goals with a can of pepper spray. No, I have a, a really good friend that I ended up buying his Wilson Combat 45 from. He, he competed for years. Um, we went to all kinds of competitions together, shot together on the weekends, had a great time. We went to a training class together and it was the first time he'd ever shot, uh, anthropomorphic targets, right? You remember the old Russian targets we all grew up shooting? Oh yeah. yeah we looked at some of those and then some that looked like a, a cast made out of Bob, uh -huh. you know, your Bob that the century aren't martial arts makes. And it was the first, and, and the instructor, uh, was Dave Spaulding, as a matter of fact, put t-shirts and, and shirts on these targets. So they looked more human than the normal paper Coke bottle targets that we were shooting all the time. And after that class, he sold me his gun. He said, I didn't want to carry a gun anymore because that was the first time he'd really thought about what he was training to do. Um, and I thought it was great yeah. that he, he made that decision. He made an intelligent, educated decision. Uh, I also thought it was great that I got a fantastic freaking deal on a Wilson combat 1911. <laughs> um, so it was really a win-win all the way around. That's what it was. Yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, that all these things that, uh, all these things go into creating mindset. So let me shift gears here, TC, because I know we're, we're, I'm keeping you on here quite a while now and I appreciate your time with the current state of the union, man. Uh, what can the average American do to become more prepared, more deadly, more resilient, take it wherever you want to go? Wow. Well, I mean, I think the first thing you want to do is make yourself hard to kill. Right. Um, borrowing from part of Andrew Bronca's tagline. Uh, chief and first and foremost, I would say pay attention. Right. Um, you know, we've all heard the color codes, you know, red, yellow, white, black. Uh, you, the vast majority of people wander through life in white. They're just they're just not paying attention. They really aren't. Uh, and then you add in cell phones and oh, my God, it gets worse. Uh, but paying attention solves a lot of problems, not just, you know, violent human predation, right? I mean, I, I was once walking through a parking lot with uh, one of my daughters and a guy came out of a liquor store, <clears throat> jumped in his car and stomped the gas and backed up. Well, I was paying attention. I saw him. I was a little hinked up about him. So I kind of slowed down. But when he stomped the gas, he came out of his parking space so hard that he ran up the back of a car right in front of me onto their trunk, you know, smashed that and then just took off. Um, if you're not paying attention now, all of a sudden my, my six year old and I are crushed by this car. Uh, I was robbed at gunpoint one time, a lot of years ago, uh, when I was at Redstone, Alabama down there training. And, uh, it was because I wasn't paying attention. I was just be bopping along, talking to a buddy of mine and bad guy got the drop on us. Uh, so paying attention makes you a lot harder to kill. <laughs> it's a ton harder to kill. 
um, don't do stupid things with stupid people in stupid places, right? That's a very old saying, and it's absolutely true. Uh, I'm sure you had the same experience as a young private in the military. The first thing you did was look for that list of off-limits installation or, you know, businesses don't go to these bars. And that was like, you took that with you and that's where you went, right? <laughs> and you did stupid shit with your stupid buddies in a stupid place. And, you know, you know, you got in fights, you got in, you chased, you do all kinds of crazy shit. Uh, well, don't do that. <laughs> you know, stay away from that. That solves a lot. Paying attention and staying out of these bad places with bad people solves an infinite number of problems. The next thing I would say is get training. Um, whatever the issues are that you think you might run into, whatever you contemplate dealing with or whatever you want to be able to deal with, get professional training. Uh, I'm forever reading books. I read all the time. I've got books in my hand all the time. And I've got a very bad habit of reading multiple books at once, which drives me insane, but I do it. Um, I've got a problem. I admit it. First step in solving it. But I like to read books about things I don't know anything about. Right? So... <clears throat> Take that attitude or borrow that attitude in your own training. If you don't know anything about medical training, get medical training. Like you mentioned earlier in the show, uh, you're, you're going to need that before you'll ever likely need to shoot at somebody or stab somebody. Um, you get that training because the knowledge that you have doesn't weigh anything, right? You can, the more you know, the less you have to carry. Uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily need to be a full-blown prepper, but have some stuff, right? You should be able to at least survive a weekend without, you know, having to resupply at the grocery store, whatever, right? You should be able to make that. Now, is everybody going to have the, the ability, the finances, the space to have six months or a year's worth of, you know, legumes and, uh, <laughs> and dehydrated toilet paper or whatever else it is they need? No, probably not. You're, it's just not a realistic expectation. Uh, but be, you should be able to last a few days, right? FEMA has a pretty good list of things that you ought to consider um, and get training on this stuff, you know, get training on how to deal with the problems you envision you need to deal with. Avoid bad places. Avoid, you know, if you know there's a riot downtown in Kenosha, Wisconsin, perhaps you feel compelled to grab a rifle and medical kit and a fire extinguisher and race off there and, and, and help, right. To contribute to the social fabric of the society you live in. I do not. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I would wager that the people that, do those such things and get jammed up as we've seen time and time and time again. I mean, George Zimmerman was just trying to help his community and look what happened to him. Uh, you know, did he think he made the wrong decision? I would not dare speak for Mr. Zimmerman, uh, but I dare say he may, if he could go back in time, want to trade staying at home, watching television, you know, Netflix and chill versus going out and, and getting on the phone that matter, getting out of his car. Um, you know, or what I'm not trying to second guess people. What I'm saying is think about these things and, and kind of ponder what you're willing to get involved in and prepare yourself for that level of involvement. Yeah. You know, you know equip yourself accordingly. Well, and it goes to I look at that Sally segue. Here we go. What, as far as equipment, what is your everyday carry TC? Ah, my everyday carry. Well, uh, generally speaking, my car, so I have, I have two, two cars and a motorcycle. They're all fairly well stocked with anything I think might reasonably be needed to use, right? So my contemplation is, okay, I'm driving to this point and that point. What am I likely to run into? More than likely a car accident. That's probably the thing that I'll run into the most. And I've, like most people have been driving as long as I have uh, in your audience, I've come upon scenes of cars. I came around the corner one time, there's a car flipped over in the middle of the road, nobody around, just sitting there, a lady and her daughter hanging upside down in the car. Um, so I have gear to deal with kind of breaking people out of cars. You know, I certainly don't have the jaws of life or anything like that, but if, if you're stuck in your car, I can get you out. Uh, I have medical gear to treat you, you know, but it's medical gear that I know how to use uh, and that I'm willing to use. You know, I, for example, the, the tension pneumothorax needle, I, I've been trained in how to use that. I don't carry them because I don't feel confident enough that I'm going to want to put an additional hole in you uh, to save your life. And I think I've got a little time usually anyhow. But I have medical gear, I have fire gear so I can put out your car if it's burning, um, you know, that sort of thing. Generally speaking, what I carry on me, and then I have some stuff in my car that if I, okay, my car has broken down, now I've got to walk home. I've got some stuff to make sure I can do that, some water and appropriate shoes. Because, you know, I'm here to tell you, a suit and Bruno Molly's is not what you want to walk 20 miles. Um, you may look good, but you're not going to get far. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I, you know, I am a Fed, so looking good is, is critical. I don't want to downplay that. Uh, but the stuff I carry on me is generally designed to either get me to my house if I'm just around the neighborhood or get me to my vehicle uh, if I'm out and about somewhere. So uh, if I were to carry a firearm, it would probably be um, my Glock 17 with RDS because my eyes are old and a, a you know, a, a homemade trigger job. I, I smooth the trigger out myself, um, but I've been carrying a Glock for 20 some odd years, been in the armor course a few times. I, I know what I want to do and I know how to do it. So um, I do that. I know that there are increasing arguments against carrying a spare magazine. I, I still carry one because uh, it's better to have it, not need it than need it, not have it. I fully recognize that statistically speaking, I'm probably not going to need it, especially as a uh, old gray haired guy, uh, not on the job anymore, but nonetheless, I carry it. Uh, what else do I carry? I carry a Leatherman usually, uh, a Wave, or I don't know which one's this. This is a Rev, just because it's just insanely useful. I, I, yeah, I just use that freaking thing all the time. Um, always carry cash, mostly because my wife doesn't understand how to get money out of an ATM when it's so much easier to just go over and take it from me. Let's so, see that money clip there, TC. Oh, you like my money? That's clip? a dual purpose money clip, is it not? Some people might make that argument. In the conversations I have had with TSA, it is an argument I will not have. That's yeah. just the money clip. Just the money clip. I love it. Clip. Others may argue differently, but yep. that's funny. Uh, a flashlight, uh, fairly small. I mean, the nice thing about flashlights, I mean, you're old enough to remember when a cool flashlight was a four D cell mag light. Oh yeah. That, that had the you know about seven lumens, right? <laughs> um, but it doubled as a one hell of a baton. And the flashlights now, I think this one that I just held up is like you know. It's, 400 lumens or something crazy like that we may have the same one it's uh i think four or five hundred lumens uh yeah this, this is, is nuts yeah. it has a strobe on it this is streamlight yeah. streamlight it's, yeah. uh, it's chargeable via usb yep, and USB. same uh, but you know i if you read the uh, 9 11 commission report people that got out of the towers most often cited reason they got out of the towers was the presence of flashlights which I thought was really weird when I read the commission report. Like I said, I like to read. I'm one of those guys that actually read the 9 I did too. <laughs> it reads yeah. pretty well, shockingly. I'm it surprised. is, yeah. Um, but you'll, you'll recall that they said flashlights got them out. I thought, well, why would that make sense? And I thought, well, wait a minute. You're in a stairwell. You're 100 floors up. It's pitch black. People are screaming. Can't see anything. You know you got to go down, but you're bumping into nobody. Somebody turns on a flashlight. Now I can see. Now I know which way to go. I can avoid problems. I can help people that have fallen down. And that guy with the light, he's now in charge. That's right. He may not speak English. He may have just been the guy upstairs mopping the floor or unloading whatever he was unloading, but he's got a flashlight. He's the man. That's right. So I carry a flashlight all the time because, you know, you just need flashlights. Uh, pepper spray, mm -hmm. you know, because not all problems are nails that need hammers. Sometimes you just need a little bit of man in the can, <laughs> karate in the can, and it solves your problem. Uh, I carry a lighter because I don't know. I used to carry a Zippo forever and ever and ever. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a mindset I have that, you know, if you're a man, you can start a fire. Uh, I, I, I'm a knife guy. So I have a um, knife designed by, which one are going here? Mike Janich. Oh, let me see. Let me see if I recognize that. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. See, and the funny thing about this knife I lost it the other day. I've had it for a few years. I couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Searched all over hell at half acre. Finally. Okay. I can't, can't find it. I got to buy another one. It drives me nuts. Right. Cause I've got a million knives, but I, I decide, okay, I've got to buy this one again. I reach out to Mike Janich. I'm like, Hey Mike, where's the best place, you know, to buy one of these things. Right. You, you're clearly the guy that knows this thing. I want to buy another one. Where do I go? He says, go to uh, X. I would say them, but they're not a sponsor of the show. So they don't get free advertising. Uh, <laughs> And so I buy it, I get it, it shows up two hours after I open the box, find the other knife. Ah. <laughs> of course, thank you for that. Um, carry a metal comb because, as I said, FBI, got to look good. Mm, got to look good, baby. Got to look good. It's not how you feel, it's how you look. People and think then, people uh, see you and ITC and they think that all this happens by accident. Right. It's it's hard work and effort. Absolutely. That's what this is, right? This natural beauty is takes effort. Uh, <laughs> And uh, let's see, finally, I got my cell phone that I carry all the time, obviously. And then I have, for social use, I carry a clinch pick. Um, I had this one made by a custom maker. This thing has never cut so much as kite thread. Um, this is as one purpose and one purpose only. Uh, it's a small knife. I mean, the blade is only, you know, yeah, palm width apart. So it's actually legal in most jurisdictions. 
which is nice because you know i'm not about violating the law and uh so that's kind of my edc i mean i've generally usually got a water bottle in my hands um just because hydrate or die right that's right and uh not terribly i mean it's a quite a bit pared down from what i carried when i was on the job yeah i don't carry an asp anymore i don't carry a secondary weapon anymore um I, I don't actually own a gun anymore. This is borrowed. I don't, it's not mine. Don't own <laughs> guns; they're scary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's my ADC. But again, it's all designed to do one thing and one thing only. That's to get me back to my car or back to my house. And if I get back to my car or I get back to my house, and you continue to push the issue, it's going to get loud. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to make a lot of noise. We're going to get a lot of people involved. So that's. Uh, yeah, I think people, you know, the vehicle is another one. Uh, and I know you and I, when we were texting back and forth last night, at some point, talk about the vehicle. And you, you alluded to some of the things that you keep in your vehicle. And and that is so key, man. A, a mobility is is your survivability. Being able to move and get on down the road is incredibly important. And I see, you know, we could talk about the, um, the advent of these vehicle CQB courses because a lot of them, probably do you a disservice every time I uh, kind of poo poo on running around and fighting around a vehicle. I get hate mail and death threats from the community that really loves that sh- sort of stuff. And so I wrote an article about it. You can find it on the American warrior society. And, and uh, I, I put up two very vivid uh, examples that you can see. It's a lot of, it's a pretty damn gory article. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. Please. Yeah. Where is all this lawlessness going, man? I know that, you know, I, I saw a thing yesterday, TC, where, you know, one of the first things Biden did when he came into office was he shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Yesterday, the news was that his administration was considering shutting down yet another pipeline. And uh, and it goes to what you said as far as the macro influencing the micro and creating conditions for additional civil unrest. And, you know, we it, you just watch the news now. You know, we had a woman get raped on a train full of people. Nobody called. Some people videotape the rape, um, but no one called for help. It's kind of a Kitty Genovese story. And then we have the Astros concert, right, with eight people dying over the weekend. And I, I put a quote in here, TC, if I could read it real quick. This is from someone who survived it. it said, despite seeing people who were clearly unconscious, Beltran said people continued trampling those who were on the ground. Quote, I was shocked to see people act so inconsiderate and feral. It was insane to see so many just run others over like wild animals, end quote. She said further, quote, people don't care. They still tried to squeeze through just to get to the front without thinking of the consequences of who it would affect, end quote. And those are just a few things to ponder as we try to look into the crystal ball of where all this is going. So what are your thoughts, TC? Well, for what it's worth, I don't know that that's necessarily a new phenomenon. Um, you know, you're old enough to remember the who concert in Ohio Oh yeah, Final concerts when a bunch of people got trampled there. And that was yep. in the eighties, maybe Yes, yep. it was a while back. Um, you know, like I was, said earlier, people in crowds, groups of people, uh, they're just, you know, scared herd beasts. They really are. And so the idea that they would trample people and, and move on, uh, at a, at a venue like that doesn't surprise me. Um, and that, that the guy that, was singing was Travis Scott. Was that his name? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, to best I can tell his, his contribution to society is hanging out with Kylie Jenner. I don't, I don't know that he's a huge name. So this isn't a particularly, uh, it's not it ain't the who let's put yeah, it that way. It, right. It's not the who, um, but it's not, uh, it, it's not a crowd of odd people. This is an average guy with an average crowd is what my argument would be. So the fact that people did this is nothing, nothing new. Um, but what about the injecting people? Did you see that? Which one? That there, that there may have been someone in the crowd injecting people. Have you seen that? I had heard that. I I don't know what level of proof they have at this point. I don't know if it's rumor or what, but yeah, I had heard some, you know, some people had some injection sites in their necks. I I don't know. Um, so I don't feel qualified to comment. Um, but the, the Katie Genovese illusion that you made to the, the rape on a train, uh, that's something new that, that sort of voyeurism, but, the people, you know, people not wanting to get involved. Uh, I think Andrew Bronco, when he was on here the last time, really said it very well, is that, you know, there, there's significant fiscal 
and statutory risk in getting involved in these things these days. It, you know, it used to be even a generation ago, you see a, somebody attack a woman on a train. You see someone put their hands on a woman on a train or anyone on a train, but in this case, a woman on a train and you belt them in the nose. You know, the, the people there are going to applaud you and the police are going to come along. They're going to arrest him and they're going to say, thanks for the help. You know, good job. You're a good citizen. This, that, and the other thing. You do that today, especially you, you, you know, privileged, entitled white male heterosexual, and you punch somebody that is not a white male heterosexual, even if he is, you're still going to get jammed up, you know, but God save you if he, you're, you're muted, by the way. Um, God save you if it's a, a protected class. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's just on suddenly you're like, wait a minute, I was doing the right thing. You know, <laughs> there's a strong, strong evidentiary uh, case to be made that Kyle Rittenhouse was doing the right thing. He was running away. He was trying to get to help and did not shoot until the first guy grabbed or went to grab his gun. He's like, Jesus, I was just here trying to help people. He's walking down the street yelling medical. Anybody need medical? Anybody need medical? And he ends up killing somebody and now he's on trial for his life. And he's like, ah, I was just there to help, you know? Um, so you see somebody getting attacked on a train and there's a crowd, right? You've got diffuse responsibility. Well, I won't do it. Someone else will do it. Um, and no one ends up stopping it. It's, it's horrible. It's terrible. And it, I think it speaks very ill of us as a society, but I understand it. Uh -huh. I mean, you see something like that going on on a train now, tell me that you wouldn't at least pause and consider. Okay. I mean, I know what your instinct is. Your instinct is to get in there and, and stop this right now, uh -huh. um, but you're going to consider it. You're going to think about it beforehand. Um, and that's, I would argue that it's not doing our society a service that we've evolved to that point that, you know, we've got prosecutors in positions now who, you know what, I'm going to put this guy through the ring. I'm going to, I'm going to make the, the process, the punishment, even if I can't put him in jail, even if I can't find a jury of 12 people, good and true, who will throw him in prison. Uh, it, it's advent, it's politically advantageous for me to run him through the ring. Uh, you know, so who wants that? Right. All right. Who wants that? Uh, and, you know, part of you can argue, look, they have the same opportunities to train, to equip themselves as I've had. Right. They, they, this person could have learned jujitsu. This person could be armed. This person could have pepper spray. And they chose not to. And now this has come home to roost. And I've got to put myself and my family at risk to save that person. I'm not saying I agree with that argument, mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I understand that that argument is out there. And I understand that people think in those terms and not, and not, let's face it, Rich, you and me and your audience members don't approach these things the way a lot of people do. You know, we all talk about how the bad guys don't think like we do. Well, the reality is we don't think like a lot of people do. Like the herd does. Right. I mean, yeah. we really don't. We think in terms of self-sacrifice. We think in terms of assisting people of, of the well beaten metaphor of the sheepdog, right? Here's a wolf amongst the sheep. It's my job to fix that, to stop this. So the vast majority of people don't think like we do. And clearly the vast majority of people made up that crowd that day that sat there and watched and videotaped it. Yeah, that's, that's true, man. Uh, Guile says the problem with the world today, you, you do good, you do the right thing, you, you get the heat. So people just stand down, uh, which is, an, you know, which again, you know, uh, I think it was Greg Elifert's who was writing or I heard him say it somewhere that they were doing a scenario and the guy ran out of the shoot house with his SIM gun. It's like, what are you doing, man? He's like, this gun's for me. It was, it wasn't to, to settle this third party dispute. This, this, this gun is yeah. for daddy and daddy's taking this gun and getting on down the road. Because like you said, that, that they could have armed themselves. They could have taken jujitsu. They could have not put themselves in that bad position. Why am I going to wade into it with, and put my life on the line and my family's financial stake on the line. I, I get in trouble, especially with my older daughter, when I point out that my cell phone is not here for your convenience. You know, <laughs> my cell phone is here for my convenience. She's like, well, you didn't, I called, you didn't answer. Said, no, I was busy. All but right. dad, I need to talk to you. Well, that's honestly, that's your problem. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I was spending me time. Exactly. You know, I, I don't ignore her. I'm not trying to say that, but you know, sometimes I'm just doing something. Yeah. Um, so, 
Uh, Bill, uh, Bill and I were in the Marines together. Semper Fi, Bill. Bill says, great show. I have to leave soon for a meeting, but I had a quick question. What percentage of illegal migrants do you think are future paid rioters? And do you think some are internally recruited to become bad actors inside the United States? I, I, I'm not willing to go to a point where I think they're <clears throat> internally recruited by, at least by political overlords, uh, to be bad actors in the United States. Um, I think that... Uh, Certainly, there's a possibility. I think they're being led in wholesale because one political party sees it as advantageous to their uh, voting numbers. Um, but I would answer that question with a question of my own. If I were to give you a bag of M&Ms, right, just a little package of M&Ms, and say, look, some of these are poison. That poison's going to kill you. Might be one, might be five, might be all. You just don't know. How many of those M&Ms are you willing to eat? Zero. Right. I mean, that, that becomes that's really the question we're asking on a, on a macro societal scale. How many of these people will you allow in unvetted, undocumented uh, and just cut them loose in the United States, knowing, statistically speaking, you know that some of them are going to do bad things. They're, they're people. There are people in desperate, in some, many cases, desperate situations, desperate circumstances beyond over above and beyond the fact that they may be rotten people to begin with. How many do you let in? Um Believe me, I've been to these countries I, like you have, like Greg Ellis. I understand the draw of coming to the United States. I get it. I, I wouldn't want to live in a lot of these countries either. I, I completely understand it. But it's not in anybody's best interest, ours or theirs, for us to just let people through the door willy-nilly. Um, there's a process for a reason. And what kills me is every other country on the planet understands this but us. You know, I mean... <laughs> When I lived in Egypt, and this is 20 plus years ago, they had an illegal immigration problem from the Sudan. Okay. Egypt had an illegal immigration problem with people from the Sudan. Okay. So that tells me Egypt had an immigration policy. That's right. They had border controls. They stopped people from just wandering across the desert into their country uh, to take advantage of their society without some level of regulation. Every other country on the planet does it. Try to sneak into Mexico, see what that gets you, right? Mm -hmm. But we are here like, come on in. Well, why? My question is why? Why would we do that? And how many people do you let in unfettered, unexamined before you get that poisonous M&M? &M? And again, it's like, okay, if, if you really want open borders, then take the open border challenge. Take, take the, I'll come over to your house with a hammer and a Phillips head screwdriver and take the, the doors off the hinges. And let's find out how that works out for you. Or we'll cut down the hedges around your mansion, Nancy Pelosi, and people can roam about freely in your, and bathe in your pool and all this other stuff. It is amazing, isn't it? The number of people that want open borders that have walls around their houses. Or the same thing. Somebody was holding a sign behind President Biden the other day as he was, you know, walking around with his Ray-Bans on giving an interview. And he said, this man that wants gun control has been protected by assault weapons for the last 45 years. Yeah. Like, hell, he does have a point. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good for me, but not for thee. I get that. That's right. Um, you know, it's I, I look at it like a lifeboat, right? You've got so many people that will fit in a lifeboat. And as you're offloading people, you can put more people in the lifeboat. Well, how many people do you let in the lifeboat before the lifeboat flips? Sinks. Exactly. And now everybody's screwed. Yeah. Right. Everybody's screwed. Um, so the idea that we're just going to let people in because we're altruistic and we're nice doesn't fly with me. Um, there's a reason that it's being done. And what that reason is, I certainly have my suspicions. I have my opinions. Uh, but the idea that, well, we're just nice folks. I didn't get it for me. Nah, nor I, sir. So uh, we've been in here for almost two hours. Time flies when you're having wow. fun. Dr. Fuller, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Where can folks get your book if they'd like to read more uh, about what you've written? Uh, well, you can get it off the oldgrayman.com. You can get through my website, one of my websites. Uh, I don't know if I have a link on uh, the Horace Group net, but if I don't, I'll, I'll fix that today. Uh, or you can get it from Amazon. That's easy. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Reasonable, Justified, and Necessary. I wrote it under the pen name of uh, Dan Bernoulli because I was still an active Fed when that came out. So that's how you would find it. And uh, you know, it, it's great for leveling coffee tables or for insomniacs. <laughs> uh, 
But you should have you should have written it under your nom de guerre, you know, Dirk Diggler. I think that would have been much more. Uh, you know what? That would have been funny. But I'm sure that uh, Mark Wahlberg would have sued me, or somebody in his 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 uh, Balawick would there would have gone after me. But uh, maybe the next one, we'll see. I do have a link to again on today's show notes. You can find a link to the. TC's most recent article on the American Warrior Society.com. It's May You Live in Interesting Times, and it forecasts a lot of the things that we're discussing today. I also have a link to his um, website, The Horus Group, where you can find out about more of the things that TC offers. And TC, anything else? No, Rich, but like you always say, I think it resonates now more than ever. The fight is coming. Be ready.